Welcome back. A few things before um, getting back into the material, a bunch of odds and ends. Uh, one is that, as I told you last time, I, I like to try to at least learn your names as best I can. And some of you have an official name that, that's nothing like the name you go by. So I meant to send this around last time. But if, if, if you have a name that's different from, you know, if you go by Jack instead of John, whatever, you know, just write it in here, please. And when it, when, at the end of the class, whatever, who, whoever's last with it, please just put it on my desk. Thanks. All right, the other thing, um, other things. About reading, I, I do expect you to read along with the course. It, you know, it's my book, so it, it's, it, it's got my jokes in it even. I, mean, it, 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 I wrote it, of course, so, so it's got my voice, which makes it, it not, it might be more helpful to you to have two separate voices describing the materials. But in any case, seeing the written word and, the, and hearing the, the audible word may help you learn. And so I encourage you to read. Whether you should read before listening to what we talk about in class or after, I don't know. That's a matter of taste. Uh, suit yourself. As I also said last time, is that, that the act of learning physics requires repetition. You, it, it goes by the first time. And so there's advantage to at least having browsed through the content before class so that when I say it for the first time here, it's not the first time you ever heard it and, and some of it might stick better. All right, uh, problem sets. I actually have put up the first of the problem sets. For technical reasons, I put it on, on Colab. So you'll find it there. None of these uh, electronic mechanisms for turning in homework are, are perfect. I mean, they, have, they have issues that I wish I could change, but I can't change them. So anyway, the, the closest I can come to having these things run the way I want them is, is Colab right now. And I've made it so that you can answer the, so you can submit it twice, which gives you an opportunity to, to, to remedy your mistakes. And I encourage you to really think about the problems before answering them. It's not meant to be a test. A, a test, you study first, and then you deal with the questions in one, in one fell swoop. Uh, with homework, it's the, sort of the reverse. You know, learn the material, think about the questions, take your time, and then answer them. And the act of learning is in trying to work through the questions. For a test, the act of learning is in preparing for the exam. Um, if, I, if I had you walk in here and there was no exam, ha ha, you know, everybody gets an A, you would, 95% of the learning experience would already have occurred. The test is just scoring. All right. Uh, grade work overall. The class, it, the, the semester grade is calculated numerically out of your scores on the homework and on the exams. People do relatively well in the homeworks, ultimately. It's a learning experience more, more than it's a grading activity. And so most of the class uh, grade ultimately comes from the exams. So as I, I encourage you to work together on the, on the uh, homework assignments, talk to me about them, you know, be really, ideally you would know exactly what the answers are every time you answer them, because you really will have thought through the whole thing uh, and learned it all. Um, the exams ultimately spread everybody out in, in, in uh, understanding. And if you blow off the homework by having your friends do it and basically, you know, what's the answer to, to question one, you will get very high scores on the homework, but not very high scores on the exams. So it's crystal clear when that happens. It's, you know, it's self-enforcing. Um, I don't have to work. The homeworks are not pledged at all. They're just you know, open season, and some people get too much help, and it shows later on in the exam. Some people do just great. And, you know, hopefully, most of you will do just great. Any questions about grading, graded work? I mean, last detail I should say is the average student in this class gets approximately a B. Um, for some of you, that's a threatening experience because you're used to ex classes that get higher scores than that on average. And no one gets a B, right? Well, no, people get Bs here. and People go below Bs, too. Um, it takes thinking. It takes work. You can't cram at the end very well because it involves understanding, and you can't cram understanding into your head. You can cram factoids, but actually knowing how things happen, how things work, takes time. Questions? Okay. Uh, 
Last thing, back more, more to material. You, uh, last time I was throwing bananas around. Um, in, in these early days, trying to, to, to build sort of the, the basic framework of physics and explain it, there are various nuisance effects around, things that make life too complicated. And I can't just jump right into the whole complicated mishmash of, of the world around us. It's nice to be able to sort of suppress some of the details initially. And so why did I go to skating as the first topic? It's because it gets rid of things like gravity. How? Because skating usually takes place on a horizontal surface. And for reasons that will develop over, over the next week or two, uh, the surface compensates for gravity. It supports your weight, something we'll deal with very soon. And so you can kind of ignore gravity. And uh, another thing that it, that it does for us, if, it, if the skating is on nice ice or on, on with smooth rollers and stuff like that, is it gets rid of friction. Another nuisance effect that we'll deal with down the road, but right now, ah, get rid of it. So, so my playing games with, for example, this, uh, you know, this Razor scooter here, horizontal surface makes gravity kind of unimportant. Nice bearings, as in what's in a fidget spinner, um, gets rid of friction issues, by and large. Um, when I was playing with the banana and throwing it across the room, I couldn't hide gravity because I wasn't operating on a surface. And if I did, then I had friction, ah, so trouble. So what did I do? I made gravity unimportant by moving, going fast, not giving gravity enough time to get anything significant accomplished. Uh, pulling a tablecloth out from underneath, underneath the table, uh, underneath the uh, play settings, I went fast. That actually suppressed the effects of, of uh, friction. So you can pretty much see inertia in action. So we'll do a bit of that for at least for a while. And often, as we go through the rest of the semester, there will be central issues and then there'll be peripheral things that are basically a nuisance in this context. So let's just like make them as unimportant as we can. All right? With that then, so back to business here. So the, the topic at hand is skating. And I just, what, I, what I've gone through up to this point is the idea that if you leave something alone, which we have to pin down, what does it mean to leave it alone? And secret that means don't push on it. Nothing pushes on it. Then its, it's motion is very simple. If it's motionless, it stays that way. If it was moving, it continues moving at a constant speed in a straight line. And that detail, you have to sort of, you have to study it for a while. It took, actually took people thinking for a long time to figure out that that's the case. Um, and people got it wrong for, for, for millennia. Uh, it's people like, uh, like uh, uh, Newton and, and Galileo who finally figured out that man, you, you leave things alone, they don't come to a stop, they coast. Coasting is, is actually, what, what does coasting mean? Coasting means moving as inertia had in mind which is to say straight line, steady pace. And so, so when I'm doing that, which I'm doing right now, this is a boring version of inertia, uh, straight line, steady pace, the pace being zero, this is, this is me moving according to inertia, which is to say that I'm, I, I'm inertial, as would, would, would be a jargon term for that, or at least being inertial means moving according to inertia. I'm coasting but it's not a very interesting coasting. And here I'm, I'm also coasting. Now it's more interesting. I'm going in a straight line at a steady pace, covering equal distances and equal times. All right? This, the, the, the exact numbers and stuff, you can do them if you want, but, but I think I, I, I've said enough about them. All right, so that's the concept of inertia. And to start, fleshing out that observation in, in more sophisticated, uh, specific uh, language, we need some language. And so I've got five physical quantities to introduce to you now. That is five things that have, they have an amount. They're quantities. Quantities are things that have an amount. You can measure it. Five cups, three kilograms, we'll talk about pretty soon, uh, 10 feet. 30 meters. And so physical uh, quantities that have amounts uh, you encounter all the time. Some of the quantities I'm going to introduce in the near future have something in addition to an amount. They have an amount and they have a direction associated with, 
with them. And that kind of a quantity where it's an amount and a direction is called a vector quantity. Fancy name. You may well have encountered vectors before. And they're just more sophisticated quantities. They're not just an amount like three cups. They're something like 30 miles an hour to the right. That's a vector quantity. It's different from 30 miles an hour to the left. And you, you care about the direction. All right, so, so that's you know, foreshadowing where we're, gonna, where we're gonna go. And I, the language that I'm developing has a purpose. It's, it's there to sort of flesh out what I call Newton's first law of motion, which appeared, I'll flip back to it, here it goes. Flip, there it is. It appeared in this very primitive form uh, on Wednesday. An object that's free of external influences, unspecified, moves in a straight line and covers equal distances and equal times. It's wordy, it's, not, it's kind of vague, what's an external influence, we gotta pin it down. To do that, these physical quantities. The first one uh, is, is position. And position is the full specification of where something is. For example, me, my position. And to, to, uh, my position right now, you, you can see where I am, but if you had to tell somebody over the telephone where I am, you need a couple things to do that. First, you need a reference that, that everybody agrees is sort of the zero of position, the, 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 the center, the origin. And my historic choice is always the, the middle of, of, of these monitors, or I guess that, that post sticking up there, right there, that's zero. That's position zero. So if you tell somebody, you call somebody on the phone, you say this little laser pointer gidget is, is it position zero, they know where it is. But if you're not there, if you're somewhere else, you have to tell the person on the phone two things. One is your distance, my distance. My distance from, the, from position zero. And distance is a familiar quantity, you, you know, feet, inches, rods, furlongs, I don't know, there are all kinds of random uh, choices. There is what's known as the SI, or System Internacional System, also known as the metric system. That it's a, that's actually sort of the nicest, most coherent uh, uh, collection of units. And I'll use it to some extent. I'll use more familiar units to some extent. You all don't think in, in, in meters. I mean, this has been going on since I was a kid. The, 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 the country has, has sort of tried to go to the metric system, and it's sort of not gotten very far. But just so, so as you know, you know, that's a foot between my two fingers. You're pretty familiar with that. I know my, my finger, that's nine inches, so I add a little bit. Okay, that's a foot. On the other hand, a meter is about that. And we've got things kicking around. This, you know, this is a one meter stick. There it is. Okay, so that's the standard unit in the metric system. This is a standard unit in the, what's called the English system of units, although it's more the American unit system. We, we, we really stick with this thing. Anyhow, to position, my position is the distance between me, this is a two meter stick, which is all convenient. I am two meters from, the, from zero. So if you call up your friend on the phone, you know, that clown is two meters from the origin. They know, they know where I am, sort of, because this is two meters from the origin. And so is this, and so, you know, so is this, and so is this. So there's more information necessary. And the more information is a direction. It's a direction from the origin to where I am. Long and short of it is, position is a vector quantity. It has an amount, which is a distance. And it has a direction, which is which way you go from the origin to get to where you're, the position you have in mind. So you call the person up and you say, he's two meters, or a little over six feet, from the origin, heading south. This is, this is pretty much south. I think that's north. It's, it's good enough, okay? They know exactly where I am. If it's up, you know, up and down, you gotta deal with more careful description, but, but it's enough information to tell you exactly where I am. So that's the first physical quantity. Position, it's a vector quantity starting from a reference. All right? Position's useful, but you know, sort of the, where, the, where the action happens is in how position changes with time. Another physical quantity known as velocity. And to see velocity, 
it, it's, it, it again is a vector quantity, has an amount and a direction. It is the, the amount by which the position is changing with time and the direction in which position is changing with time. So for example, if my position, you know, you see my position here. If I start to head to your right, and I'm going to go in English units, so I'm going to go one foot per second, which is a perfectly reasonable speed, one foot per second, and I'm going to head to the right. My velocity, which is going to, this is going to end soon, is one foot per second to the right, and now I've got to stop because I ran out of room. That's quite different from one foot per second to the left. Right? This is a totally different velocity. It has the same speed. The speed is the amount part of velocity. Um, the amount, stop, stop, of course. The amount part of a vector quantity is, has a fancy name. It's called a magnitude, which I rarely use. If I use it, I, it's an accident mostly. It's the amount of, of this vector quantity, it's like throughout the di direction part. And it's, of course, it's, vector quantity has the direction part. So, so it's got this magnitude or amount and this direction. You need them both. If you only got one, you don't have the full information. And speed is the amount part of velocity. So those words are not interchangeable. They're used in common language interchangeably. It's like if you want to sound unsophisticated, you're being interviewed, you go, well, the, the person was, was, <laughs> was speeding. They were velocitying. No. If, if a person was traveling to a certain, I made a stupid story out of this, and I forgot my own train of thought. Uh, it happens. You, you hear people talk about, well, this person had, a, had too, too high a rate of speed. That already starts to sound like they're being sophisticated. But, 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 but they'll go to, they had too high a, a velocity. And that's even more pompous. But it, it's, it's not the same idea. Velocity and speed are not interchangeable. Velocity is more information. It's which way you're heading as well. So, so you can travel at 60 miles an hour. We don't care which way you went. But if you're traveling 60 miles an hour to the east, you're going to end up in Richmond or nearby. If you're traveling 60 miles an hour to the west, welcome to Stanton. OK? So velocity has an amount and a direction. Second, uh, la well, last tidbit to say about velocity is, is if you want to find someone's position, I'll, I'll back all the way up to position, you only need to look once. One glance tells you where they are. If you want to know their velocity, you have to glance twice. So you, know, you look once, there he is, and moments later, I'm over here, I moved. You can see I traveled a certain distance, and a certain amount of time passed, and if you divide the, the, the distance, and actually, well, it's, it's, the, it's the difference in position, because it's got direction to it. That change in, in position divided by the time, that is my velocity, at least on average. You don't know exactly what I did in between, but, 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 the, but you get the average velocity just fine. So two glances for velocity, one for position. Any? Thoughts or questions at this point? And you got the difference between velocity and speed. I mean, some of this is, is immaterial or, 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 or you know, it's not going to change your life, but, but the, the blurring of velocity and, and speed is something that, that it shows up in you know, articles you read or something like that. And it's just like, no, that's not right. It's just, it's just confused, confused thinking. All right. So having introduced then this concept of velocity, we can, we can add a, an observation, uh, a more sophisticated observation, to the life for a skater who's free of external influences. When I said you move in a straight line at a steady, uh, covering equal distances and equal times, we can pin that down with, with language. We can call that, we can, first of all, we can describe that in terms of, of a velocity. And we can notice that velocity is not, is not changing in amount, same distance per, per time. And it's not changing in direction, because it's a straight line. It's, the velocity is the same. It's constant. So the observation that we used to say is traveling, covering equal distances in equal times along a straight line boils down to one simple statement. They travel at constant velocity. This, this is me traveling at constant velocity, approximately. Steady movement in a straight line. So that makes it possible, then, to rewrite Newton's second, uh, sorry, first law with better language as an object that's free of external influences moves at constant velocity. End of story. Uh, so this is, this is sort of a 
observing how inertia works. That leaves us then with the, uh, the to pin down that free of external influences thing. And we need a third physical quantity for, to do that. The physical quantity is force. And force is just a fancy name for a push or a pull. It's not a twist or a spin. That's, we'll, that will come to that later. That's associated with rotation. This is, with go, this is associated with going somewhere, a type of motion known as translation. Uh, you know, whether that word sticks or not doesn't matter. But, but, but pushes and pulls gum up inertial motion. They change it. So to be inertial, you have to be free of pushes and pulls. More specifically, forces. OK, a force is another vector quantity. You've, you've exerted forces on things your whole life. You know that if you push, oh, I don't know, the car, I don't know. You, you push your friend to the right, your friend undergoes changes in motion toward the right. If you push them to the left, it's different. Things happen differently. You can push them equally hard uh, in different directions, and then different things happen. Um, <laughs> speaking of pushing on things. So, stay. So forces, you, you're, you're familiar with forces in the English system of units, the, the most familiar unit of force, the standard by which forces are measured, is the pound force, or just the pound. You know how, you, probably in your mind's eye, you've got sort of a sense of, of how hard it is uh, a pound of stuff pushes on you. It's, that, that, that's a, that observation involves a lot of additional physics we'll, we'll come to. But basically, if you hold up a pound of sugar, your hand is pushing up on that sugar with a force of about a pound. Similarly, the sugar is pushing down on you with a force of about a pound. You, so you, can, you, can, you feel what a pound is like. Uh, the SI unit of, of force, the, the metric unit of force, is, is called the Newton, after Sir Isaac. And a, the Newton is smaller than a pound by about a factor of four. It's about how hard a, a, a small apple just to be cute, pushes on your hand when you hold it steady. So Newton is a, a modest amount of force. You can have 1,000 Newtons. Now it's pushing hard. But it's, it's the standard to build, to build with. So if you exert a force on something, you, you, this, this changes motion. The forces, you can measure them if you want to with various gadgets. You can measure them in pounds. You can measure them in Newtons. And there are other units that who cares. OK, you all right with the idea of a force? All right. I can barrel along. Eventually, I'll start pulling teeth and, and get you all to ask me something or say something or observe something. Oh, another thing to point out is that, that you all have experiences that I've never had. And so, yeah, I sit in a little closet here, never have any experiences. No, but um, if, if something comes up that, that, that it's relevant to something that you've experienced and, and that people would care about, say so. For example, I mean, the a, a me most memorable example was, was we'll talk about how a bicycle works and how, you know, how it is that you can ride with no hands um, and all kinds of things associated with that. And there are people who, I've never ridden a motorcycle. It's, people would bring up the similarities between riding a motorcycle and the differences. Because it, it is different. It's got a wider wheel, which makes a difference in, in, in other aspects of it. But uh, so bring them up. Oh, and another one of my favorites was you know, I could talk about air resistance effects on, oh, I don't know, bicycles or something like that. But I've never skydived, and there's very little uh, hope that I ever will, or yeah, hope or fear <laughs> that I ever will. But there have been people, there are, some among you have, have done that, and you have experiences that you can bring in, like uh, one, one student at one point was pointing out that, that when you do skydive, you know, the, the, the meekest, mildest young woman who I would never have guessed was like a completely fanatic skydiver, was this a completely fanatic, well, enthusiast. And the issue that you never want to go over somebody when you're skydiving. Because when you do that, you get into their, their effectively their wind shadow. You draft them, something we'll talk about later on. On, they're fighting the wind resistance that you no longer have to fight. And you pick up distance on them, and you hit them. So when you skydive, don't go over someone else. Um, maybe some of you know that. 
I would never have known that had she not told me. All right, back to the business uh, here. We now have pinned down Newton's first law to, 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 to some extent, but uh, we can now add the word force. So the external influences that affect motion and gum up inertia, that basically, that basically make, make inertia not directly rel uh, the whole story at least, they're forces. So an object that is not subject to any outside forces, or, and I'll come back to the parenthesis, outside forces moves at constant velocity. So if, you, if, if nothing is pushing on an object, it goes at constant velocity. Examples of this would be uh, the Voyager. It, it, it's hard to get away from forces completely, but the, but the Voyager spacecrafts that, are, that have left the solar system, they, they launch you know, in, in my youth, and they're still cooking, still zooming along. They're coasting at constant velocity. They're essentially free of forces. There are just tiny little forces left because of the solar system and because of the galaxy and the universe as a whole. But otherwise, they're basically going in a straight line at a steady pace, and they will for all of eternity. They are never going to stop unless they hit something. Um, they're following Newton's first law. So out, no outside forces, you, you go straight and true. This, I should point out, that this is not entirely intuitive. Uh, and and, you, and, and you, you have to fight your own sensibilities here to change your worldview, you, you grow up with the, op, with the sense that if you push on something, it moves, and if you stop pushing on it, it stops. And that's just that's what you observe, right? Push on it, it moves. Stop pushing, it stops. If you take that to a sort of its logical conclusion, that means that forces cause velocity. If you push on it, the velocity goes away from zero. If you stop pushing on it, the velocity goes to zero. Make sense? Consistent with observation? But it's not, it, it's, I wouldn't say it's not correct. It is the, what you observe, but what you're forgetting is there's friction around. If you, I'm not the only thing pushing on this stick. The table is pushing as well by way of friction. And if we could get rid of that friction, then you would see the real motion of an object that's free of forces. It's not motionlessness. It's no change in velocity. So um, the Greeks got it, Aristotle got it wrong. And people just assumed he was right forever uh, until people finally figured out, uh, uh So if they'd had more ice around in, in ancient Greece, global cooling, they might have noticed that, uh-oh, you leave things alone, they don't stop. They do what they were doing. They move at a steady pace in a straight line, i.e. constant velocity. So anyway, you all have to fight your own tendency to think things stop when you stop pushing on them. They don't. They keep doing what they were doing. All right? So you know, watch things just as you're wandering around. and you, you Watch things coast past you. It's not because something is pushing them that they're coasting. It's that something is not pushing them. So they can coast. All right. All right. How about starting and stopping? So this is the other possibility. This is the, the non-inertial story is, is when you change your velocity. You go from motionless to moving to moving to motionless. That world of, of activity, obviously quite important, involves changes in velocity. And, we, and I, I already described that velocity is, is the rate at which Position is changing with time. For those of you who know calculus, you know, this is not a quantitative class, of course. And, uh, but many of you have taken calculus. And I'll say it anyway. Okay, so you, if this means nothing to you, it means nothing to you. But, but velocity is the, is the time derivative of a position. If you, if, you, if you see how position is changing with time by way of a derivative, bang, out you get with velocity. It has direction in it, so it's vector calculus you're doing. But, it, not, nothing, that, that's not a, an important detail. Uh, if you then look at velocity, which has been constant in, in the story up until now, and you take the first derivative of velocity, and, it, and it's not zero, if, if velocity is changing with time, the first derivative of velocity is another physical quantity, which I'm about to introduce, which is called acceleration. So setting that aside then, back to no calculus land. Um, 
acceleration is the rate at which velocity changes with time. So if, if well, right now I've got my velocity zero, it's still zero, it's still zero, it's still zero. It's like the most boring possible velocity. And um, I'm, I'm, not only is my, yeah, I'm not accelerating, I'm not even moving. It's, it's nothing, nothing. Okay, now let me start moving at constant velocity. And, and you're supposed to not watch for a second. Let me get started. Okay, now I'm going. One foot per second to the right. And while I'm doing this, one foot per second to the right, my velocity is a certain amount, one foot per second to the right, one foot per second to the right, one foot per second to the right. So I'm not accelerating. Stop, end of story. So while I was walking, I'll do it again, okay, to the left. Constant velocity. My velocity is not changing with time, so I am not accelerating. My acceleration is zero. I'll, I'll show you acceleration shortly. It's acceleration is zero, and I am inertial. That's what inertial is. Per, something that's not accelerating is inertial. It has no overall force acting on it. They go, they go hand in hand. If there's an overall force acting on it, it's, its velocity is changing, and it is not inertial. If there's no overall force acting on it, its velocity is constant, and it is inertial. OK, so, so velocity that's constant is, is, is perfectly possible, and it involves no acceleration, which is literally no change in velocity with time. How about if velocity is changing with time? So let me show you, let me show you acceleration. And I'm going to, I have to think, I mean, I don't multitask worth spit. So let's try this. I'm going to accelerate to your right initially. So here you go. I'm not, my velocity is zero, and now it's a little bit to the right, and now it's a little more to the right, a little more to the right, a little more to the right, and so on, and then stop, otherwise I'm going to run out of room. So, so, so during that, that period, my velocity was changing. You can see it's small at first, and then bigger to the left, bigger to the left, bigger and bigger, bigger, bigger. If I keep on accelerating, of course, you know, whew, out we go. Um, hey, it's Friday, right? Uh, <laughs> the middle of the weekend, you'll see. Just wait a couple weeks. Um, so acceleration involves velocity that is changing with time. It turns out it is caused by a force, so they go together. And what else about it? It's acceleration and velocity are different. They're related, but they're not the same thing. And that takes some time to, to, to wrap your head around and get clear. Velocity is easy to see. It takes two glances. I'm here. A glance later, I'm here. I've obviously moved. My position's changed. I must have had a velocity that was not zero. Acceleration's more subtle, because I can be moving. And you look, am I accelerating? Well, you've got to look for a while and figure out, oh, no, he's not accelerating. His velocity's constant. He keeps, he keeps on moving, but it, it's not the, the, the distance he covers each second isn't changing, and he's going in a straight line. Acceleration, actually, it takes, it turns out, takes a minimum of three glances. You have to look once, you have to look again at, say, a certain interval of time, and you have to look again at a third, after yet another interval of time, and notice, wow, during, between the first pair of glances, he traveled a small distance, and during the second pair of glances between them, he traveled a big distance. He must have accelerated. The speed with which he was traveling was increased between the two. That's acceleration. All right? So acceleration is, is it's the change of velocity. It's a, it, it takes some subtle observation. And it's not the same as velocity. And, you, and getting them separated will be a challenge for some of you. I mean, here I can say it, and you go like, oh, yeah, uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-huh. And then when you have to face the questions about it, you'll go, oh. So this is why I you know, encourage you to keep plugging away at this, trying to understand it, because it takes time. Uh, acceleration is caused by force. So a force, in the absence of a force, you do not accelerate. If nothing's pushing on you, you move at constant velocity, because you're inertial. If something is pushing on you, your velocity changes with time in the direction of that push. So um, pick something to do that with, ball. So the ball here is, is, is essentially motionless. If I want to make it accelerate to, to your left, I have to push it to the left, and I changed its velocity. I made it accelerate toward the left. There was a brief period which it picked up speed, and then it got all messy because I ran out of room and time. Okay, stop. 
You okay with acceleration or questions about acceleration? Please. Is it still acceleration if you're going in constant velocity in an arc? And that's a great question, and thank you for asking it. This is why asking questions is so important. And I mean, I, I, I'll answer the answer. The observation th th that contains two terms that are not quite self-consistent. Constant velocity means you're traveling at a steady speed in a straight line. So that forbids an arc, OK? What's, what, then what's the arc? Well, you can be at a constant speed. Which, forget the, set aside the direction. You can be at constant speed. If your direction of travel is changing, you are accelerating. So this, here I am, one foot per second. My speed is one foot per second. It's absolutely constant, even to the extent I can do it. My direction of travel here, uh-oh, away from you, to your left, toward you. My, my, speed's all, my, my direction of travel is all changing. So I'm accelerating. So I'm mean, going to go back to your question. If you're traveling at constant speed in an arc, then you're accelerating. You can't travel in a constant velocity in an arc, because that, that's a contradiction in terms. All right? Uh, yeah. Other than hitting something, what other external forces would there be in space? Gravity. Escaping gravity is extremely difficult, I mean, impossible. Because gravity reaches to the edges, of the edges of the universe. It gets very small very fast. It falls off with distance, it turns out, uh, as the square of the distance. But it doesn't go to zero. And so the whole universe is interacting by way of gravity. You all are exerting gravity on one another. It's small because there's not a lot of you. I mean, a lot of substance in, in each of you. Oh, that sounds terrible. You have lots of substance. Um, but, but the gravity is weak for that reason. Gravity can be, gravity, the only thing we really notice gravity from uh, is the Earth, because it's so massive, a term I'm about to come to. It has so much mass. Uh, it, it, with enough distance, though, even the Earth becomes sort of insignificant. And eventually, it gets to the, the only things that are, that are massive enough to have uh, effect on you is like an entire galaxy or clusters of galaxies. Is that, is that OK? Electricity and magnetism also go, go on forever. So, so uh, that, that's another topic. The forces associated with them never, never drop to zero. They get close. Yeah. Ah, thank you. This is again why I, why, why I need your questions. Is if there are multiple, if there are multiple forces acting on you, they, y you respond, you, you're only one person, so you can only res accelerate in response to this collective set of forces, not to the individual ones, unless, unless you break into pieces. Um, and, and, and these, these horrible, uh, Thoughts go through my head of drawing and quartering, which I will set aside. Sorry, once in a while, a uh, train of thought drifts off into. But okay, so you're responding. You can't respond to all the forces individually. You respond to their sum. And when you add up forces, because forces are vector quantities as well, they have an amount and a direction, the, the addition is more sophisticated. It involves taking into account the direction. And, and you can, we could get lost for a week in, in learning how to add up vector quantities, which is. OK, it's useful, but it's not relevant to this class. But you can figure out, if two people, uh, Bob and Alice, are pushing on you, Bob is pushing you to the right, Alice is pushing you to the left, and they are both pushing with 17 newtons of, of those forces, they cancel. Their net effect on you is nothing. Is that OK? Can you, can you? Ah, if they push in, like from the south and the west, then they can't sum to zero. There's no amount of forces other than both zero that, that together they come up as, as nothing. If, if they're like this, they can cancel to zero. You can be inertial while you're experiencing multiple forces as long as they, as they cancel. That is the case right now. The ball, ah, the ball during that roll was experiencing gravity down, a push up from the table that was equally strong but upward. We'll, we'll deal with that eventually. And the net force on the ball was zero. What net force is the sum of all forces. So the net force on the ball was zero. It was inertial. And that's why it moved at constant velocity. And this is a better example. I'll get off the table where you know, 
Why, you know, why is it doing that? Nothing is pushing on it overall, but it is experiencing individual forces. They just cancel. Net force, net force literally is the sum of forces acting on an object, and it's, the sum was zero. Is that okay? If you push things from, from cockeyed angles, they can't sum to zero. They sum to some, some piece. If, if you're pushed to the right and up, just so you can all see it, that sums to something heading off up and to the right. So there's an overall force like this on you. You will accelerate in that direction. Is that okay? Other questions? Oh, thank you. Yeah. Uh, so, so the question is about, is, is we've seen these various measures of, of changes of vector quantities with time. Is there anything that measures the change in speed with time? It, is, that a, is, that the amount of, is that the amount of acceleration? I think actually it's not because of these direction issues. Um, it would be a perfectly good quantity. You could do it. I don't know whether it has a name. The change in speed with time, it has, there's a no direction aspect to that. Is that okay? It's, it, it, must, it must have a name, but I don't even know it. Yeah? Oh, okay. Also, great. You know, thank you for these questions, right? Uh, negative accelerations. Because there's a direction aspect to, to acceleration. What does it mean? Uh, yeah, my response is complicated because I, I, I have my, my sort of set thoughts that I'll, that I'll follow. Hopefully, this will step on your, on your uh, cover your question. Let me show you the weirdness of acceleration. I'm going to head to the right before the story starts. So my velocity is going to be to the right, but I'm going to accelerate toward the left. What do you think happens? Story hasn't started yet. Let me get going. Okay, there we go. I'm going to accelerate to the left. And I'll stop the story right now when I reach zero velocity. All right. During that time, I was, my velocity was toward the right. My acceleration, however, was toward the left, meaning my velocity was changing in a leftward manner. It was losing rightward character. Is that okay? So I was slowing down as, I, as my my rightward velocity decreased. That has a, that, that particular case of, velocity, uh, of acceleration, when you're accelerating opposite your velocity, is called deceleration. It's just a special name for a, for a certain type of acceleration. And we could also say that I was moving to the right. My velocity was to the right. And my acceleration was to the right, but a negative amount of the stuff. So I had a negative amount of rightward velocity. Uh, vectors, when you take the negative, when a vector has a negative amount, that's exactly the same as a positive amount pointing in the opposite direction. And we'll, we'll bump into those sorts of things from time to time. So a velocity, this is a negative amount of rightward velocity. It, it, it just works more smoothly if you're allowing things to become positive and negative and work their way through zero. Okay, so let me continue that story of, of leftward acceleration while my velocity is rightward. Here we go. Story hasn't started yet. Here we go. Okay, now my acceleration is going to be to the left while my velocity is to the right. I slow down. I hit zero if I did it right. And then my velocity begins faster and faster and faster to the left. That's, that's one continuous flow of leftward acceleration. I come to a stop. And then I go backwards. And that, OK, it's, it's, it's fun and games on the floor. But we're going to see very soon, ver in the world of vertical motion, with gravity as our first force, this is right around the corner, watch what happens to the ball. Its velocity is upward, 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 and downward, downward, downward. How did that happen? Well, it accelerated downward the whole time. The moment it left my hand, I stopped pushing on it, its acceleration was downward. It was losing upward velocity. It got to zero. Nothing special happened at zero except that it was momentarily motionless. But it continued to accelerate downward and now picked up speed in the downward direction. So, so, so my little fun and games here with accelerating to the left and then 
going back, is exactly the same story as accelerating up, oh, sorry, accelerating down while going up and accelerating down while going down. Is that okay? Does that answer your question? Certainly okay. Other questions? All right. Whew. Mass. All right. The last of my physical quantities. And the first one that doesn't have a, it's not a vector, it's just an amount. Uh, the name for an, a quantity that's just an amount is called a scalar. Who cares? That's just its name. Uh, I'm not big, you know, assigning names to quantities that we care about is useful because don't, I don't have to keep describing them. That thing that resists acceleration, oh, you mean mass? Yes. Just give it a name. Um, some of the other names are just postage stamp collecting. All right, mass. Mass is it's, it's the, essentially a measure of an object's inertia. How hard it is to get that object to stop doing what it was doing and do something different. The more massive it is, the more it resists changes in its velocity. In other words, the more massive it is, the more it resists acceleration. Okay, so a, an example of an object with relatively little mass, a golf ball. Making it go uh, switch from heading to your right fast to heading to your left fast, easy. That's a huge, I caused an acceleration here. That was rightward motion, the velocity was to the right, some number of feet per second. Then it's to the left, some number of feet per second. During the turnaround, it was accelerating. And I had no trouble causing that. So even a modest force caused a dramatic acceleration of this little guy. It does not have a lot of resistance to acceleration, so it does not have a lot of mass. Mass is an object's resistance to acceleration. Nothing to do with gravity, incidentally, just to, to, to lay the groundwork here. Mass is, is unrelated to gravity. I shouldn't say that there's issues, uh, but there are distant ones. Okay? It's, 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 an, it's an inertia thing. It has to do with the more inertia that something has, the more mass it has. This is easy. In contrast, oh, much harder. Okay? This thing, when it's going to the right, really is tough to turn around and bring back. So this doesn't accelerate nearly as easily. It takes a, a bigger force, or alternatively, the acceleration is much smaller. That has more mass than the golf ball. Mass, the unit of mass, the English unit of mass is some screwy thing like the slug, which you don't even use. Um, there's an alternative associated with a pound, but the metric unit, much more useful, and one that actually has made progress into, the, into our society, it's called the kilogram. In one kilogram, you have a sense for what, what, what one kilogram is. One kilo, none of these is a kilogram. Um, a liter bottle of water is a pretty much a kilogram, and you know how hard that is to shake. Shaking is a way of measuring inertia, and therefore measuring uh, mass. If you can imagine shaking a one liter bottle of water, that's, that's the resistance to acceleration associated with a kilogram. So I can, I can pop up Newton's second law. Let me just finish with this. Newton's second law, for, you know, many of you have taken physics for, for at least a year, and you've encountered Newton's second law, and it gets distilled down to F equals ma, which just, just, just sucks the life out of that poor law. First off, each of those entries has a name. It's force, it's mass, it's acceleration. And second, setting it out like that, F equals ma, which involves no division, destroys the cause and effect relationship that I like to see in most equations. So I write Newton's second law in this form, as, as the acceleration of an object is equal to the net force on the object divided by the object's mass. On the right is the cause. Force is a cause of acceleration. Mass is a resistance to acceleration. So it's the battle between those, the force causing the mass resisting, and the division yields what? It yields the acceleration that is caused by that pair. So um, what this then tells you is, is the harder something that's being pushed, the more, it's, the more it is accelerating, which is to say the faster, and, uh, the, the faster its velocity is changing with time, because that's what acceleration is. And objects that have more mass respond 
less uh, dramatically than objects that have less mass. So that's why the division is, is informative. The more mass you have around, the harder it is to cause acceleration. So uh, that's a good stopping point. Enjoy the, enjoy the weekend, and I'll see you on Monday. <laughs>